The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration, and was taken while Cornelius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph all went for, also went up from the town of, Ga of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver a child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In the region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then the angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on ease peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw them, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of all our hearts, and every action of all our lives be always acceptable to you, Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I wonder if you can guess what are the two most difficult services to preach at. I know most people would say a funeral or a wedding, and, and they can be tough, but typically what's going on kind of gives you the, the theme for that day, so you can fill it in without too much trouble. No, the, the two most difficult days to preach are Christmas Eve and Easter. And that's because virtually everybody who's here thinks they know the entire story. They think there's nothing new to be told to them. But then at the same time, you sometimes have somebody who's brand new and has never heard the story before. So you're, you're struggling to get that mix. That's one of the reasons some of my colleagues refuse to preach on Christmas Eve. They say, oh, the gospel and the hymns tell the story. There's no need for me to add anything to it. Well, I think that that may be true of the of the broad brush of the story, but I always like to get into the details. And this year, I got into the details because of a granddaughter. <laughs> Granddaughters have a habit of doing that to you, of asking you those questions that you have to struggle with. And our 10-year-old is really good at that. And I have no idea how we got talking about this, but we're at the table and she was fascinated about how little we know about Jesus' upbringing. I mean, think about it. We hear about a couple days, we don't know how long, around his birth. Then there's a day in the temple for Sim Simeon to announce who he is. Then two years later, there's a day or two when the Magi, the wise men, come to visit him. Then there's some vague references to an escape to Egypt. Then a day in the temple at age 12, and that's it. Last time we hear about him, till he's somewhere around 30, maybe 10 days out of 30 years, Scripture feels is are important enough to talk about. So our granddaughter was wondering why so little. Is Jesus' life for those first 30 years so unimportant? Well, 
Let me begin with my conclusion after spending some time thinking about her question. And this may surprise you. Because, see, Jesus' ministries, which begin with the wedding feast at Cana, his first miracle, and, and then going all the way through his arrest on Monday, Thursday, those, those three years of his life, I want to submit to you, may be less important to us than the 30 years we know so little about. I mean, knowing about his actions and his teachings is very important. I'm not, I'm not questioning that. And his teaching should impact us and help to guide us every single day. But those 30 years, those are what connect with us. Now, you're not going to have much time to think about this today or tomorrow. So if you want to, please take your bulletin home, maybe even jot some notes today and, and ponder what I'm about to say later on. And one of the things I want to invite you to do is spend some time thinking about a couple good things that have happened in your life recently, you know, months, years, whatever, just what jumps to mind, good things. And then think about things that weren't so good. Sadness. Might be something small, might be something large. What made you happy and what made you sad? Now, the reason I'm challenging you to think about this is because I want to know if you shared those things with anybody. Do you have a friend who's a good enough friend that you could say to them, this made me very sad, or, or I'm just so happy because of this? And if you, if you don't, that's, that's unfortunate, but imagine you do. Imagine how, how important that person is to you. But what's critical is that person needs to be able to identify with what you're talking about. An alcoholic shares best with an ex-alcoholic. If a person has not suffered that way, they really can't relate. And a person who is unemployed and hurting can tell another person what it is like when they finally find a job. But if that other person has never been afraid their family might go hungry. They can't really understand that joy. Well, those 30 years, we can connect to Jesus because Jesus has gone through all that we're going through. We know almost nothing, as I said, about those 30 years, except where he lived and what that society was like. And it's from those general principles we can make some reasonable guesses. Jesus grew up in a small village. We know that. We are told, we say, that Joseph, his father, was a carpenter. And that could have been true, but even if it was, the economy would have varied dramatically from moment to moment. Plus, nowadays, many scholars, as they really study the ancient languages, say that that term that we generally translate carpenter would be more accurately translated as a day laborer who worked with wood. Somebody who was struggling to find a job on any given day. In other words, Jesus knew good times, and he also knew lean times. Jesus knew times. I don't think there's any question about it. He would have known times when food was scarce. There were no unemployment checks, no welfare checks. Families would help each other. There weren't any formal food pantries, but your cousin would, help, would give you some food if they had any. But lean times tended to be over the whole area. There wasn't any food to share. So if we've ever been in financial hardships, no, you can talk to Jesus because he understands. And then we look around our society today with so much anger and nastiness, and, and, and we're concerned, maybe even scared, rightfully. I mean, think about what happened last week in Greensboro, where an entire neighborhood was covered with nasty flyers of people insulting and threatening people. 
Elected officials hear death threats simply because they voted the way they thought they should vote. I mean, how can Jesus understand the times we're going through? Well, we may forget Jesus had to run away and hide in Egypt because of death threats. He had to run away and hide. And then later as an adult, do you remember? A crowd of his friends and relatives threatened to stone him, possibly to death. And then in the end, Jesus was killed by government authorities, but really because of the religious leaders. They pushed the government authorities to do it. So when we talk about the times we're in, we can pray to God because Jesus understands. Well, you might say, okay, what about this pandemic with the, with the mass and the social distancing and all that? That's nothing compared to what was going on during his time. If you had a, a skin disease that was obvious, maybe even just extreme acne, you were excluded from society. You had to walk around ringing a bell, yelling unclean, and nobody was supposed to come within 10 feet of you. And if you were lucky, you hoped somebody left food on the corner for you to go pick up. And if you didn't obey the rules, if you tried to, tried to walk into society without warning them you were coming or just staying out of it altogether, you weren't just ostracized on social media. You were thrown out of the village, probably to die, because nobody else would take you in. Jesus saw pandemic. Jesus saw death. We, we're guessing, we aren't told, but Joseph is never mentioned again once Jesus turns 30. In fact, from the age 12 on, we never hear of Joseph again. So best guess is he probably died sometime during that period. Certainly, he saw other relatives and friends suffer and die. And not only did Jesus see the suffering of the sick person, but he saw the suffering of the loved ones. Remember what happened when Lazarus died? Jesus did not mourn Lazarus' death. He was upset over the suffering that Lazarus' friend and relatives were going through. Jesus understands. Now, I suspect if we, we were listening closely right this minute, we can hear Jesus saying to us, wait, don't forget the good times. Don't forget the joy. See, Jesus understands that too and wants us to share those times with him. Because when we share them with him, we're bringing God into all of our life, not just the bad times. Jesus watched people he knew fall deeply in love and have a, a wonderful life. He knew what it meant to be loved by someone. That very special feeling. Jesus watched new birth, new, new lives come into the birth, and the joy and the excitement that happened around it. Jesus saw all these good things. And as I mentioned, the first time we hear, from, hear about him as an adult is at a wedding feast in Cana of Galilee, and I'm not sure that's, that's just arbitrary. Jesus was in the midst of a multi-day celebration, and I have absolutely no way to defend this statement, but I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus danced and laughed and had a good time at those events. I believe he enjoyed life. Jesus understands. Jesus wants us to share those times, too. So as we, we celebrate Jesus' birth, as we should, we're actually celebrating much more than his simple arrival, and certainly much more than the three years at the end of his life. We are celebrating that Jesus was here so we know Jesus understands. We know we can talk to Jesus. We know Jesus can relate with us. Jesus is more than our Lord and Savior. 
And maybe at times, it's even more important for us to remember that Jesus is our friend. Amen.